Well, River Valley, I'm excited to be preaching this weekend, and uh, thank you. Last week, Pastor Rob started a series called The Second Half, where we focus on scriptures, where we love the first half, but we're not so sure about the second half, and so he asked for the second week of this series for his second son to preach the second half for the second time to all the campuses. Don't worry, I'm done. Not a second more, I promise you ever done something really embarrassing? And maybe you say that was embarrassing what I just did. It's okay. <laughs> maybe it was waving at somebody that you thought was waving at you. <laughs> or maybe you're at a movie and they say, enjoy the movie, and you say, you too. <laughs> I remember there was a time uh, at Sparkle Conference, and uh, I was working my first job, which I worked at the store Buckle at the Mall of America. And uh, this is back in its heyday. You know, everybody was coming in and doing the thing called the Buckle Challenge. If you don't know what that is, you try to get in and out without being talked to because we all worked on commission. And so we wanted to talk to people, make sure that we could, you know, see if they needed help. We wanted to be the first ones that talked to you so then we could claim your purchase for ourselves. It was very selfish, of course, but... At the time, I was working uh, for a guy who attends our Shakopee campus, and uh, he was helping out the Sparkle Conference, uh, giving some clothes for a fashion show. And I was working there, and was, it was kind of a blend of my worlds. I was working at Buckle, but I was helping with Sparkle. And um, you know, I, there was no Sparkle buckles involved, you know, but I, I, we, we had this fashion show, and we forgot some clothes. And without thinking, he tossed me his keys, and he said, go to the mall and pick up the clothes. Now, I had a car. But my car was a 1999 Oldsmobile Intrigue, and his was a newer Lexus. And so I thought, I'm not going to ask any questions. He said, go get the clothes. And so I went there, and I was driving just a little bit too fast. And I was crossing the Cedar Bridge, and all of a sudden, before I got to the end of the bridge, I saw a a police officer. And I stopped so fast, knowing he was going to pull me over, that he actually had to pull out into the bridge and turn around so that he could get behind me. (laughs) And I was so nervous, and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm in my boss's car, and I've never been pulled over before. I'm 17 years old. I'm panicking. I have no idea what to do. And so he comes up to me and he says, hi, are you Reginald? I said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not. Reginald, he's my boss. And um, I don't know that he's heard the story, by the way. And so um, I'm glad he's at a different campus. I said, no, he's my boss. And I, I'm so sorry, we had a, a fashion show and there's this women's conference happening and I don't know what to do. And he said, yeah, you stopped really fast. I think you saw me. I said, I know, I was totally speeding. It was totally my fault. I'm so sorry. And that cop was very gracious with me and he came back quickly and he said, well, you have no record on you and so I'm gonna just ask you to slow down. It'll be all right. The women will get their clothes when you get there. (laughs) And so I got back and he asked me, hey, did you get everything? Was everything great? Yeah, everything was great. Uneventful, uneventful. (laughs) And so this may be the first time he's heard that story. But in the Bible, there's a famous story of a woman who was caught in one of the most embarrassing and horrific circumstances, far worse than being pulled over in your boss's car. And there's a verse that we love to quote. It's one of the most popular verses that maybe you've heard quoted, even from people who are not Christians. And they love the first half of the verse, and that's John 8, verse 11, where Jesus says to this woman who's caught in the midst of adultery, he says, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. You see, that first part is quoted so often. Neither do I condemn you. I don't condemn your sin. I don't condemn you. We love that. No matter if you're liberal, conservative, you're, you're Buddhist or whatever, what you'd say, I love that verse. I'm not condemned. But what Jesus follows it with, go and sin no more, is often much harder to practice. Now, This incredibly popular story is quite complicated, not because of the message, but because it actually is maybe not put in the right place in the Bible. If you open your Bible and you see in John chapter 7, verse 53, you'll see something that says, the earliest manuscripts do not include 753 through 811. And oftentimes they're in brackets. 
And before you tune out, I won't spend too much time on there, but it's worth noting that I wanna share a few challenges to this, as well as why it's still incredibly significant to us. And so the early manuscripts that we have of the Gospel of John don't contain this story. And when it is placed in scripture, it's placed in four different locations, John 7:53, 7, 7, 21, 25, and even sometimes it's placed in Luke 21, 38, because it seems to maybe fit better there. The grammar and the language is inconsistent with the rest of the book of John, so people think that if it was written by him, it wasn't at the same time, but most likely it wasn't even written by him. And then lastly, if you take that section out, the text actually flows really well from 752 to 812. And so most scholars believe that maybe this is misplaced, so that's why there's brackets and they make that note. So then why is it still important for us today, and why should it make us not doubt this scripture? Although it's not in the earliest manuscripts, we do have many ancient Christian writers that bring validity to the story through oral tradition. The first Bible wasn't printed until 1500, and so it was handwritten over and over again. This passage also doesn't introduce new doctrine or theology that contradicts the rest of Scripture, but rather strengthens the message of the Gospels in the entire New Testament. And I actually think it's one of the greatest stories that captures the Gospel. Most modern scholars agree it may not be in the right place, but they consider it to be a trustworthy account of an encounter that Jesus had. And lastly, Pastor Rob is out of town, and this is the passage he assigned me to teach on. (laughs) So we start in John 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and sat down and was teaching them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders at this time were trying their best to find something to trap Jesus because they did not like what he was saying, that he was calling them out on their over-religion and these rules that they kept adding to over and over again. And of course, we know that they lost the heart of the law of Moses, but they were doing everything they could to keep this law and were holding that against people. And so they found this woman caught in the act. And you know, our first question should be, where's the man, right? As they say, it takes two to tango, right? And so you're wondering, all right, so there's this woman that was caught in adultery and they bring her. And so as you read this passage, you think that maybe this was a setup or maybe the man that she was with was a powerful person. They didn't want to mess with him, but they wanted to use her as an example to trap Jesus. And so it wasn't really this woman that was on trial. It was Jesus that was on trial. And you see, the problem in this situation for Jesus was if he were to say, yes, you should stone her, there's two big problems. One is that the Jesus we know, the one who's friend of sinners, who's merciful, who's full of grace, maybe 2,000 years later, we'd hold him with maybe some contempt and say, why would you do that? That's an evil thing to do, that Jesus standing there watched this woman get stoned and maybe it would affect his relationship with sinners. But more importantly, if he said, No, you shouldn't stone her. He would be going against the law. You see, adultery was a very serious sin. There were three sins that they that the Jewish people thought were some of the worst sins, and that was idolatry, idol worship, that was murder, and that was adultery. So this was one of the worst sins, and it was punishable by death. And so if Jesus says to not do it, then of course they say, Ha ha, you're not you're not fulfilling the Mosaic law, you're a false prophet. But on the other hand, if he does this, The Jews were under Roman occupation and they actually didn't have the authority to commit the death penalty. And so if he did this, now they would have an excuse to trap him with the Roman government and then they would be able to kill him. Of course, that's why Jesus was crucified and brought before Pilate because the Jews couldn't do it themselves. And so you see this conundrum that he's in with this real person in front of him and he has to do something. And of course, in our Lord's wisdom, he does what only he can do. Something that none of us would do is he cuts right through the midst of their challenges and he solves the problem in an unbelievable way. And we see this story continue where Jesus bent down and he starts writing in the sand. And this is one of the most speculated verses of the New Testament about we don't exactly know what happened or why Jesus did this, but you know, some maybe say that he was just buying himself some time. You know, he was God after all, but he was also human. And so maybe he was just buying himself some time. 
Or others have suggested that maybe he wanted the Pharisees and the religious leaders to sit in their accusation. Have you ever said something about somebody else and you've pointed your finger at them or you feel like a situation's unfair and then the person who's responding to you pauses? You sit and you think about it and you go, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have been so quick to point a finger. Or lastly, some have said maybe he was writing the sins of the people that were there. And again, I don't know logistically how that works. I've written in the sand before, but I've never written it backwards in the sand while people are yelling at me and the language of Aramaic or Hebrew, whatever he was writing in. Uh, logistically, seems like it might be a challenge, but of course he was God. But the Bible doesn't tell us, and I think it's because it doesn't really matter for the story, what he wrote. What matters is what happens after that. They continue to ask him as he's writing. They continue to ask him. And he stood up and said, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and he wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. I love what Tim Keller says about this story. He said, he disturbs the comfortable, which are the Pharisees, and he comforts the disturbed. You know, we'll get to Jesus' response to the woman in a moment, but I think oftentimes we give the Pharisees, like Jesus responded to them with anger and with frustration, but I actually believe that Jesus responded to them with much grace. And other times in scripture, we see him call them a brood of vipers. We see him flip the tables before he's betrayed, and this wasn't what Jesus responded with. He actually responded knowing, yes, you're right. That that's what the law of Moses says. You're right. That adultery is an evil thing. It's a terrible sin and it leads to death. And you're right that the penalty for adultery according to the Mosaic law is for her to be killed. But I believe that what Jesus knew is that everything was about to change. We know that Jesus, he didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill it. And I can't help but think that Jesus in that moment was thinking about the what was about to happen in just a short time, what he was about to do on the cross. And he's thinking that this woman is here right away and he's saying these people have lost the heart of the law. These people have lost the heart of what it is and absolutely what it is, is it's gonna lead you to death. But there's a real person right in front of us and I think so often in our culture today, it's easy for other people to just become that. Other people. We don't know their name, we don't know their story, we don't know their background. We just say, look at what they're doing. Look at the sin that they're caught up in. And we live in our self-righteousness. But Jesus stood up to her in verse 10. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. What a story. But see, that's where most of us stop. But actually that phrase, neither do I condemn you, is the bridge. It's the link between the first part of that verse and the second part of that verse where Jesus says, go on and from now on, sin no more. You see, the word condemn means to sentence, to accept your shame or to doom somebody. See, Jesus, what he says, he says, I don't condemn you. And what he's telling that woman is your day of judgment, I'm pushing it down the road. You see, if she were to be stoned in that moment, she would be condemned because she would have died in her sin and she would have had no chance to be restored. And Jesus is saying, I'm not saying that adultery is not sin. I'm not saying that what you did wasn't wrong. I'm not saying that what you did, even that it doesn't lead to death because it does. What I'm saying is I'm kicking down the road your judgment day because I know what I'm about to do for you. And if you can grab a hold of that grace and you'll know soon enough of what that is. And then if you can go on and sin no more, then you'll receive true judgment and that judgment for you will be freedom in Christ Jesus. And of course, that's the message for all of us today. One person's happy for freedom in Jesus. But that's the message that we have. Is we're not condemned, why? Because of what Jesus has done and for this woman, Jesus hadn't yet died on the cross, but for all of us here in this room, he has. Now for the second part of the verse, go on and sin no more. It seems like an impossible request. Of course, Jesus, easy for you to say. 
You're perfect. How can I go on and sin no more? How can I never sin again? And I don't think that's what Jesus is asking us to do. You see, what Jesus is asking us to do, and I read a few commentaries where someone said, he's not asking for perfection, but he's asking you to change your direction. I'll illustrate it maybe with this way, that if you're driving somewhere and you get your GPS notification that says you've, you've gone too far, you need to turn around, and you keep on driving, and then the next exit says, take this exit, you need to turn around, and you keep on driving. You get another request, another, another notification. Turn around, turn around, turn around. Finally, it gets to the point where you're too far away from your destination, where it doesn't even know what to do. You're rerouting, 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 and rerouting. And that's how the world lives. They're rerouting over and over again because they don't know their destination because they're not going anywhere. But when we accept Jesus, and again, at the end of the service, there'll be an opportunity to accept Jesus. When we accept Jesus, we've actually changed our direction. And so you're following after God. You're following after the things that he says. You're following after his word. You're doing your best to not sin. But what sin is like when you're a believer in Jesus is you know your direction, you know where you're headed, but it's kind of like when you're going a certain place, but your autopilot in your head takes you somewhere else, right? That's our flesh. You're going home, but you take the exit to go to work. And, and then your wife says, why are you going that way? Oh, I, I don't know why. I just, I saw the exit and that's the exit that I usually take. See, there's a big difference between that. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that continual sin over and over again won't lead us to death, but those little moments of, of, of slip-ups, those little moments of sin are things that we come back to Jesus and we say, God, that's not what I'm after. That's not what I'm, I'm supposed to be doing because I know the direction that I'm headed. But when we're slaves to sin, we don't know our direction. And Paul addresses this that maybe people feel like, well, grace is so good. Like, it's so amazing, and this is where the world lives. They think that grace is so awesome that why don't I just keep sinning because it makes grace even better, right? We all see the testimonies of people who've been saved by so much, and you say, that's an incredible testimony. Why don't I go do that so then I have an amazing testimony of what God has done in my life? And Paul warns us of this in Romans 6.1. He says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we've died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? We have this attitude of, oh, grace is so good. God is so loving. He's so caring. He's so amazing. So I can just do whatever I want and God is gonna forgive me. And Paul says, you're just as bad as the Pharisees on the other side of this that you've missed completely what Jesus is saying. He continues in verse 15. Another question, well then, since God's grace, his grace has set us free from the law, does that mean that we can go sinning? We don't, we're not under the law anymore. He says again, of course not. You've totally missed this. What Jesus has done for us is so incredible. It's so amazing that you can't go on living in that same way. Unfortunately, many people who experience the amazing miracles of Jesus they continued on in their own ways. And we know this because when Jesus left the earth, when he died, when he was crucified, even when he rose again, that there were only a few hundred that were gathered there in prayer. There were only a few hundred that believed what he did. You know the story of the 10 lepers where 10 lepers are healed and only one comes back. We're often so focused on what's in front of us. But you may say, how do I practically fight against the temptations of sin? How do I practically live in this way to where I, I don't want to be going a different direction? I, I, I feel like maybe I've, I've, I'm, I'm doing the right things. I've said yes to Jesus. I'm saved. He lives in me. And, and some people say, like, how do I know? How do I know if I'm truly saved? How do I know if I really have accepted Jesus? You see, our desires, they begin to shift. The things that we used to do, that we love to do over and over and over again, all of a sudden it changes to where you get this thing called conviction. I was talking to somebody and he was explaining this, this conviction in his life and he was brand new as a believer. And he said, yeah, I, I uh, just said yes to Jesus and uh, I went home and uh, I told my girlfriend about it and then I slept with her. He said, but then I felt bad afterwards. So I've never felt bad before. It was great. He goes, is that conviction? I said, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. 
And there's little moments of conviction that come into our life. But it's little things, ah, oh, I shouldn't have said it that way. Before, when we were slaves to sin, you, you didn't think about it. Oh, I, I want to get that person. I want to be out to, out to get them. I only want to win in my own life. But when we're slaves to sin, that's what we do. But when we are following after Jesus, we begin to grab a hold of this conviction and realize that God has given us everything. So how could we live in that way? And there's a parable in the Bible of the unforgiving servant. And I'll summarize it here. I don't have time to read it all. But basically, the story is told and Jesus is saying there's a servant who the king forgave him of essentially billions of dollars. Billions of dollars and billions of dollars. And then he goes out to one of his friends who owes him $20. And he starts yelling at him and berating him and telling him, you owe me $20. And he's brought back before the king and the king says, how could you act this way? You've been forgiven of billions of dollars and you're trying to, to ask somebody for 20? It seems so crazy for us to do, but unfortunately we get caught up in this. We do it all the time with our neighbors. We point a finger at the person on social media that doesn't have the same belief that we have about a certain topic. We fall in sin ourselves, and the message today is that if Jesus has done so much for us, then how could we go back and live in sin? Paul's saying it's not legalism, it's not the law. It's yes, yes, of course grace covers it, but you see you've lost the heart of it. If you see what Jesus has done for you, if you know like this adulterous woman that was put before everybody ready to have stones in their hands that would kill her, that she would die, if you are that person, if you knew that you were about to die and then Jesus stopped everyone, nobody condemned her, and Jesus says, neither do I condemn you, what would be your response? It would have to be that I can't go back to the things that destroyed me before. I can't go back to adultery. I can't go back to drunkenness. I can't go back to talking the way that I did because Jesus has done so much for me. So how can we practically fight against sin? Just three things before we close. One is we have to separate from temptation's source. A lot of us, we say yes to Jesus, we follow after him in our life, but then we go right back to our old ways. We go to the same places on our phone, we have the same friends and go to the same environments, and we say, why hasn't the temptation gone away? Because we've not separated ourselves from the source. And we need to take the source out of it and say, I need to go into a new place. I need to maybe go to church a little bit more. I maybe need to be in a small group. I maybe need to, instead of listening to those debates over and over again or the, the things that make my blood boil, I need to listen to things that lift my spirit. We need to get rid of the source. And the second thing is you need to be reminded that you're a new creation. We need this hope. You see, if Jesus just said and rolled his eyes at this woman and said, oh, You've made this hard on me. If I tell them that you're not supposed to be stoned, they're gonna say I'm a false prophet. But if I do, then I'm gonna get in trouble with the Romans. And so, in my wisdom, I figured out a way around this to where nobody else is here. So I don't condemn you and go and sin no more. That wasn't Jesus' response. Jesus wasn't rolling his eyes at a sinner. It was his compassion that led him to make this decision. And I think sometimes we feel like Jesus is rolling, rolling his eyes like, at, oh, well, he's just, yeah, I know. Another time, you know, getting drunk, it's, uh, grace covers that, but just next time, maybe don't, don't drink as much. Or another time where you said really bad things about that person at work, and it's just grace, grace kind of covers it. And when, when Jesus, the painting of Jesus kind of doing that thing, it just like, it covers all of your sins and your problems. That's not hope. That's the world's attitude. And, you know, it's this attitude of if you go into your sin and you think, oh, I'm just gonna follow the sin, but thankfully grace is gonna save me. I'm just gonna follow the sin. I remember in baseball, my dad used to say, if you think you're gonna strike out, you're probably gonna strike out. If you think you're gonna fall down, you're probably gonna fall down. My grandpa used to throw the ball at me really, really hard. I said, why are you doing that? He said, so that you're not afraid of the ball. Didn't work. (laughs) 
We need hope. We need to think, no, I can defeat this. Why? Because of what Christ has done in my life. I can defeat this because of what Christ did on the cross. I can do this. And that's the message that Paul is saying to us is there is hope. There is hope because of the grace that we have. There is hope because of the forgiveness in Jesus Christ. There is hope to defeat sin. And yes, you may slip up. Yes, you may do things that you don't want to do, but there's hope to get better every single day. And it's this word called sanctification. And I won't get into it because we're going to talk about it in our big word series in a few weeks. But we can continue to be more and more like Christ. Later on in that verse in Romans 6, Paul continues. He says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. You couldn't do it. And what was the result? You're now ashamed of the things that you used to do. Things that end in eternal doom. But now you're free from the power of sin. And it becomes slaves of God. Now you do these things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We know the wages of sin is death, but have you grabbed a hold of the free gift? Have you grabbed a hold of eternal life? The third one, if you're taking notes, all those who said, where's the third? What's the third? Spend time with Jesus. You say, that's too simple. It's too simple. Just spend time with Jesus. That's really it to avoid temptation. That's really it. I'm telling you. 1 John 3, 6 says, anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. When you understand who Jesus is, when you understand what he's done for you, when you understand what the death on the cross meant for you and meant for your eternity, then sin starts to become less significant. Sin, the the desire, the goal, the the enticement of it becomes so less significant because you say, I have Jesus as a replacement to the things that I thought satisfied me temporarily, but actually led me to shame and condemnation. What a trade. I have Jesus Christ. I have forgiveness. I have freedom. I have eternal life in him. And so that's the question for all of us today. Have we traded our shame? Have we traded our condemnation that the world has to offer? And if we have accepted the grace, and if we have, then are we going and sinning no more? Are we following after the life, the abundant life of Jesus Christ. There's so much in store for us all. And maybe you'd say you're in this room, you're watching this message. You say, I feel like I'm the Pharisee. I'm the one that's quick to grab a stone and ready to throw it at somebody. I can tell you, you might even be right. But the posture of Jesus says, sometimes even when we're right, we're wrong. Because Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came to save the world. And maybe you feel like you're that woman that you're caught in the midst of sin, of shame, of evil, of horrible things, and you're embarrassed. You're put out in front of everybody else. You say, I'm in the middle of my shame right now. I'm here to tell you that God can free you from your shame and he can save you and give you the gift of eternal life. And maybe you're on the other side of that and you say, I've received the forgiveness, but I'm struggling with sin. I, can I encourage you that there is hope, that there is hope to beat the thing that's been holding you back, the sin that you feel like you've never been able, able to overcome, the pornography that you can't shake, the lying that you keep telling, the, the belief about yourself, the unforgiveness that you hold towards somebody else. Jesus can free you in a moment. So no matter where you are, God wants to give you what you need because that's what God does. Would you bow your heads with me, Lord? I pray right now for all of us in this room, God, that we would not be people that point fingers at others. We'd not be people that are almost proud to throw a stone at somebody who's sinned, but let us recognize that they are our neighbor, that they are our friend, and that that is us. Lord, I pray for those in a moment that are gonna receive Forgiveness that are gonna accept. They're not just gonna receive your grace, but they're gonna respond to your grace. Lord, I pray that they'd grab a hold of it with both hands, realizing that you've forgiven them and freed them from so much. And Lord, lastly, I pray that as we continue this walk with Jesus, as we continue this walk with you, that you would sanctify us, make us more like you. Make us more like you, Jesus, as we continue to follow us until the day we see you face to face. 
Lord, what a gift it is to serve you. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.